My name is Abdullah Washington. I'm a black man. Now, I know that's a surprise. <laughs> I know some of you might think that I'm a drug dealer or a pimp or a deadbeat dad, but I can assure you we can be much more than some of you may think. I myself am a member of Mensa, an actuarial science major, a career business manager, a poet, father, and scoutmaster. My parents moved a lot when I was growing up, so by the time I was nine, one of the ways I used to make friends was by doing other kids' homework. Now, I didn't know anything about style, but I just didn't want the other kids to get caught copying from the encyclopedia. Sorry. <laughs> but one day, I had done so many other kids' assignments that I ran out of time. And I naturally turned to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, when I went to go get my report back, my teacher stopped me and asked me, Abdullah, what does this word mean? Well, OK, I was busted. I didn't know anything about style, but he did. Now, he could have thrown me under the bus to make an example out of me, but he chose to do something else. He decided to believe in me. Oh, and what was that word? It was paradox. Webster's dictionary defines the word paradox as a tenant that is contrary to popular opinion. Something composed of two or more opposite things that seems impossible, but is in fact possible or true. How do we succeed in a system that stigmatizes poor and black kids? I've witnessed the best minds of my generation shot or locked up until they're old men, all because they could only get the wrong attention. Rejected by teachers, little love seen at home, accepted by the streets dying to be men on their own. Originally, all they wanted was some food, new shoes, and pops back. Dad's gone because these jobs just laugh. They've exchanged ABCs for Gs, and how do you keep a child's mind on these elemental Ps when enemies take these elements of peace? Crying for attention, get sent to LD classes, labeled a disruption, completely backwards, end of discussion. So paradoxically, like Dr. Spock, I raise eyebrows with Botox in them. Surprised eyes are wide, but their scope is thin. Seeing a box, I must fit in, but I spit box in the wind. So dose me with oxytocin, I have chosen this pen. At night, I fantasize that I could write the right lines. To convince the final few, we are no different from you guys. It's puzzling, isn't it? The elephant in this room that I am just a talking animal, par a parroting, just squawking to you a paradox. Now, who's equal? Who am I equal to? Big Wash is a paradox because Pops left, but I remember my mom telling us we're still a family. And the logical conjugates of your comical arguments just offended and sensed me. Stop using those confusing words, Big, but I blessed like bliss is, yes, gifted like Christmas. And every time those oxymorons said I was articulate, it was like they copulated me on my success because they expected me to be a malapropist simply because of their own skin prejudice. P.T. Barnum said fools are born by the minute, so I guess it's time I made my egress. We took our boys to the park one day across the street, and our boys were having so much fun, the other neighborhood kids decided they wanted to join in, so we let them. But after a minute, one of my younger scouts came to me and said, one of the neighborhood boys told him that he was going to kill him. Right in front of everybody. So what was I to do? That little boy couldn't have been more than 10 years old. What was the right thing to do with a group of children who would someday soon be teenagers themselves? One third of high school age black children are suspended or expelled from school. This demographic makes up 60% of the youth in state prisons. All of us can recall past summers of teen violence. Uh, but the Sufi mystics have a saying that when consciousness is first stirred, the first mind that arises is the blaming mind. All the who, what, where, whens, and whys of blame, we blame the parents, the children, and those with position, indulging ourselves in all manner of chicken and egg debates, pointing our fingers and, blame, and placing blame on these children. And yes, the children are the perpetrators of some of these crimes, but they are also the survivors 
of these traumas. But so I don't blame our children because our cities have become families that only get together at funerals. Now, this looks like a totally negative situation. When I was a retail store manager, I came across a book by noted psychologist Richard Farson called Management of the Absurd, Paradoxes in Leadership. And one of the paradoxes he describes is that the best resource to solve a problem is the person or group that presents the problem. And he gives a widely accepted example in the form of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I challenge you to look across your distressed communities and you will find parents, plenty of them, and children doing far more than their fair share to stem this tide of violence. One of the biggest challenges young people face in making decisions is that they simply have not lived that long. Who remembers being 13 and thinking, four years, that's forever. Now try being poor. It is said that the poor are most influenced by the present, the middle class by the future, and the wealthy by the past. And in his self-development masterwork, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, author Stephen Covey describes the time matrix, illustrating why it is best to make one's decisions in the second quadrant, focusing on issues that are important, but not urgent. Poverty forces people to live in the first quadrant, dealing with issues that are important and urgent. Poor children worry about what they will eat when they leave school, what they will wear, and how they will be safe facing life's challenges. Poverty forces people to make bricks without straw any way that they can. Inner city drug dealers face the highest odds of being killed than any other profession. Those at the top make all the real money and the rest are subject to frequent arrests. And it's a shame to see all those lives wasted to make money only to hand it over to someone outside of the community to stay out of prison. And with their criminal records, they will never be able to become the very doctors and lawyers that their activities create so much demand for. The paradox in this is that the fears of better off Americans create, produce a self-fulfilling prophecy. Redlining by banks indicate not only where not to invest, but also where to invest. And urban flight only magnifies the problems of the poor. In The Seven Habits, Covey also describes how we absolutely fetishize independence. But independence, that's an adolescent desire. The real world is an interdependent one, and the mature thing is to accept this fact. However, across the nation, a game that economists call the prisoner's dilemma is being played, involving the cities and counties and the suburbs. The best possible result between cooperation, given the opportunity of cooperation and betrayal, would come with cooperation. But because there is no trust, time and again, we choose to betray. When police live outside of cities they work in, the city gets less policing, the county gets free policing, and police are seen as an occupying force by inner city dwellers. Games like Three Strikes You're Out are played with the lives of the poor, and plenty of fathers who would like to be a positive influence languish in prison or cannot get jobs to become a stabilizing influence because of mistakes in the past. So we have to rely on our community centers for jobs, reentry programs, prevention, instead of focusing so much on prosecution. Stephen Covey's fourth habit is to think win-win. Warren Buffett once said, when the tide goes out, you can see who's naked. And in our nakedness, are we ashamed like Adam and Eve? Are we ashamed like Cain when he asked, am I my brother's keeper? We have allowed far too many of these children to grow up thinking they will only find hope in a gun. The US government rates the value of a standard life at between six and nine million dollars. And if I can get children to think of themselves at least this highly, then they will not be swayed by fear or the dope man. So we've got to find a way to reinvest 
and our future, our children. The general interest formula describing the return on an investment depends upon our initial investment, our rate, and time. So if we compound at a natural rate with 100% of our interest in our children, then we will achieve the maximum possible return. The frustrations of inner city children are real. They can feel themselves growing up. They have pressures to provide and to belong. Many of these children just get guns because they fear for their own safety. But these children are like any other children. And there are plenty of good parents here also. Stephen Covey's fifth habit is to first seek to understand, then to be understood. So if you'd like to make a positive contribution, you must first go with an open mind to the ones who are already trying to be the medicine in the mess before you start telling them what they should be doing. Chances are they're already doing it. And the only thing that's missing it might be you. Of the millions of children playing high school athletics, the odds in playing professionally is one against thousands. However, there are four million children in the ninth grade right now. Two thirds of them will graduate and go to college. Universities issue three million degrees annually. And young adults with a bachelor's degree typically make twice as much as those without a high school diploma. But education isn't just about a salary. Education also opens up a possibility of someone becoming a positive influence on a society itself. But mainly, I just want our children to avoid violence and crime because I don't want them living in fear of the system. For if you fear a thing, how then can you ever become the master of that thing? And that little boy in the park, I'm sure he expected me to yell at him, to chase him away from our scouts. But these are our children. So I asked my scouts to get in our circle and invite all the neighborhood boys. The boy's mother was calling for him, but he was too embarrassed to go anywhere. Then I spoke to them about self-respect and dignity. And then I asked them to all shake hands. I pray that this child remembers this moment when he becomes a teenager, that somebody believed in him. This is a standard deviation curve. It can be skewed to the left or to the right. What millions of American parents in inner cities are trying to do is to shift this curve completely in a positive direction. The paradox in this is you get what you expect. And if you only see the negative, you will be of no help. But if you are a living, breathing, thinking, feeling human being, we invite you to the beloved city. That which unites us is far stronger than that which divides us. It is the influence of the sun and the moon that causes the tides to rise. We invite you to multiply our influence. The people presenting the problem are the best resource to solve the problem. And what's up, Doc? Don't stop trying No matter how this crisis rises No one dare try to divide us It's high time to swallow my pride You picked me up when it was so, so, so cold outside Ain't it a mess? Multiplying, no dividing, no idea how I will make it through. Ooh, where are you? The rising tide, 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 the 
rising tide, the rising tide, the rising tide, the rising tide, the rising tide, the rising tide. The current of the future, no idea where they may take you to. I need my last, no idea how I will make it. Tell me who is my neighbor? Which one of you is my neighbor? Someday you may need a favor too. Ain't it satisfying? Is it so surprising? How surviving? Feeling overriding? Multiplying? No dividing? No hiding? The rising tide, 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 the rising tide.